Um, our final presentation uh, today will examine the architecture of the city as a whole and address the question of how we maintain and preserve the larger city through the smaller scale decisions we make about individual buildings. How has the cultural context in which we make new buildings influenced the way we view existing ones? What kind of building environment are we making as a whole? Our final speaker, Stephen Sems, is a designer, teacher, and scholar. A practicing architect, Stephen has become an authority on how new buildings should relate to existing ones through the publication of his book, The Future of the Past, a conservation ethic for architecture, urbanism, and historic preservation. Stephen has also studied how changing approaches to the conservation and interpretation of historic monuments has been influenced by the recovery of the classical language of architecture, a recovery he has chronicled in his book, The Architecture of the Classical Interior. Since 2005, he has taught architecture at the University of Notre Dame School of Architecture, where he is current research and teaching, where his current research and teaching focus is on um, issues of architecture in historic settings. He served as the school's Rome Studies Program Director from 2008 to 2011, and he is currently director of the new graduate program in historic preservation. Let's welcome Stephen Sims. Thank you so much, Kim, for that introduction. Thank you, Richard Driehaus. Thank you to all the previous speakers. I feel a little intimidated coming up here last. Uh, many of my best lines have already been delivered today, and many of my slides will be familiar to you. I apologize, but what I'll try to do, um, uh, many, many of the things I'm going to say will relate to things said earlier. I won't take the time to make the, the explicit connections. Hopefully you can do that but I am going to try to tie together some of these ideas and kind of into a more general framework. Uh, okay. Competing views about architecture and historic preservation today are often characterized in terms of stylistic differences, an argument between modernists and traditionalists, if you will, but I'd like to suggest that the debate is really about something else. There are two competing conceptions of architecture, at least two, maybe more than two. I'm going to talk about two. One based on time and the other on place. I'm going to discuss both of them and argue that we should shift from the currently dominant time-based view to the other, older, and now resurgent, once again, place-based one as a way of creating a built-in environment that is beautiful, sustainable, and just. Many current conversations about architecture and preservation are defined in terms of time. Architects speak of, quote, the architecture of our time, unquote, and preservationists refer to historic resources as, quote, documents of their time, unquote. This is striking given the traditional focus of architects on place, sort of what you expect architects are supposed to be concerned with, but reflects a dominant cultural attitude in the arts generally today in which innovation and up-to-dateness are often valued more highly than durable accomplishments or mastery of a discipline, things that take time. This attitude among professionals in our field is based on a very particular understanding of time that, so far as I can tell, is unique to our field. Architectural history is seen as, in a linear fashion as a timeline divided into periods, each with its own style, as shown in my handmade diagram. Indeed, the words period and style have become interchangeable terms. On the timeline, periods and styles succeed one another in an irreversible sequence. There's no going back, and the next thing always beckons us. The job of the architectural historian is to locate buildings on the timeline according to their conformance with the corresponding period or style. Architects are expected to make new buildings that register their date of construction by conforming to recognizable temporal indicators or, more plainly, current fashion in design. Whether historical or contemporary, buildings are expected to document their place on the timeline 
by conforming to the style associated with their date. The sequence as a whole, from distant antiquity to the present, constitutes an official narrative thought to express the zeitgeist, or the general spirit of the age. In the 19th century philosophies of Hegel and Marx, the zeitgeist is the direction or aim toward which history inevitably marches. History has a program, and we need both to understand what that program is and do our best to bring it to fulfillment. The content of the zeitgeist program can vary. For Marx, it was the class struggle that would eventually bring the proletariat to the top. For Herbert Spencer, it was the idea of evolutionary progress. For others, the advance of technology or some other general aim. Whatever its content is presumed to be, the movement of the zeitgeist was seen as inevitable and irreversible, like the passage of time itself. Since each period of history has its own unique style assigned to it by historians, whatever is built in that period must be in that style if it is to be accepted as of its time. A building whose style corresponds to the one associated with its construction date is considered authentic. For example, a building in the Georgian style is authentic if it was constructed during the reigns of the four Georges, roughly from 1770 to 1840, or perhaps during the Georgian revival between 1876 and 1940, but not if it was built after the Second World War. Authentic buildings enter the historical canon. Inauthentic ones are either ridiculed or simply forgotten. These examples are from Charleston and Chicago, but we could multiply, multiply them ad infinitum. Sir Nicholas Pevsner and Siegfried Gideon, who've been mentioned previously, first widely disseminated this paradigm in the middle decades of the 20th century, and it has been widely and uncritically accepted as the model for cla classifying and judging buildings ever since, dominating architectural education for the last four generations or so. This approach and its philosophical underpinnings can be identified by the philosophical term historicism, not to be confused with the way architects use the word, but the philosophy of historicism is essentially this. Now, when I was in school, we were assigned to read Pevsner and Gideon, and everybody was required to read them. I just asked my 10 graduate students last weekend when we were here in Chicago how many of them had ever read Siegfried Gideon or Nicholas Pevsner, and none of them, all of whom, by the way, had had undergraduate degrees in architecture from modernist schools, none of them had ever heard the names before. So I think that's interesting. Maybe there's hope. As you can tell, I'm being critical of this particular approach. Beyond the work of the historians, the historicist approach also shapes how new architecture was conceived and practiced. Since our own era is seen as unique, as different from the past eras as they were from one another, an authentic new building must appear unprecedented. The literature of the modern movement repeatedly declares that realizing the unique imperatives of the time requires a new way of building that stands in contrast to that of the past. Similarly, contemporary architecture is preoccupied with experimental, unprecedented forms, new materials, and new technologies, and various kinds of innovation. The paradox is that the more people fixate on innovation, the more the buildings tend to look alike. Now, that isn't always the case, of course, and there are, of course, genuine innovations in all of those areas. What, what I'm interested in is sort of the uh, sort of uncritical expectation that innovation alone can, in fact, solve our problems. They start looking alike because time-based architecture tends to be less concerned with physical context than with what we might call the temporal context. New buildings seem to have little in common with their locations or pre-existing neighboring buildings, but everything in common with their contemporaries around the world. They are united by their response to the fleeting present, which is the same everywhere, rather than to the particular conditions of a given location, which are often quite varied. The result can be an obsession with iconic but placeless individual buildings that seem as though they could have been built anywhere. 
Moreover, their temporal specificity precludes their visual coordination with earlier buildings to form ensembles and neighborhoods. When they do find themselves gathered together, they often tend not to compose a larger form, standing out as individuals, which means they have a lot of trouble composing a city. At the architectural scale, designers using this approach tend to dramatize the difference between the present and the past by building in conspicuous opposition to older neighbors with contrasting materials, composition, scale, and detail, detaching the new construction from older adjacent structures. Buildings that refuse to connect uh, and uh, can only be juxtaposed, and designers are encouraged to exaggerate differences and dramatize contrast. Over time, the city can devolve into a collection of unique and disconnected specimens, or what I like to refer to as an architectural zoo. The time base, and that wasn't necessarily intended as a totally as a pejorative term. If you think about what a zoo is, a zoo is an exhibition of animal species that have to be kept apart because if they were free to roam around, they might eat each other. And so you can imagine, for example, if you walk along the High Line, the High Line is like the best architectural zoo because you see one, you know, you see the Gary building and you see the Nouvelle building and you see the, uh, the, all of them in a row and you sort of see, you know, the lions are here, the giraffes are there and the antelopes are over here and they're, that way they're kept apart and nobody eats anybody else. The time-based conception has impacted historic preservation theory and practice in two important ways. First, our preconceptions of architectural history based on the official narrative that I showed in that first diagram underlie our decisions regarding what to preserve, limiting our perceptions of the significance of sites to what serves the timeline, as when the exemplification of the Chicago school becomes the criterion for protection, and sites that do not participate in that narrative can be undervalued. This is something uh, that uh, uh, Bob Brugman talked about in his address last night. A poignant example of this uh, is the story of the Mecca Flats apartments, which, as Daniel Bluestone has written, were sacrificed in part because this important work did not fit the story of the Chicago school that the historians and preservationists wanted to tell. In this way, seeing historic resources as, quote, documents of their time, unquote, can blind us to other sources of significance, such as their artistic importance or their association with non-elite communities. We are tempted to focus on iconic buildings and neglect non-iconic places and neighborhoods. One hopes that the campaigns to preserve the works of Bertrand Goldberg, for example, however commendable, do not come at the expense of community-based efforts to preserve living neighborhoods with diverse populations, cultures, and economies. Secondly, the time-based conception demands that future work must conform to that narrative. Any new construction added to a historic site must therefore be differentiated from adjacent historic fabric to preserve the legibility of the timeline and the authenticity of both the new and the historic work. This view was codified in the Venice Charter of 1964, which required that any addition to a historic site, quote, depart from the architectural composition and bear a contemporary stamp, unquote. Now, you might say, well, who Who's to say what a contemporary stamp might be? I mean, it's 50 years later. Contemporary architecture day is very different from the way it was in 1964. But if you think back to 1964, you know exactly what they meant by the contemporary stamp. And of course, we could take a different view of it today, but we're kind of still stuck with the term. The Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation from 1977 revised last in 1995 requires new elements be differentiated from the historic fabric, but also compatible with the historic materials, features, size, scale, proportion, and massing. Those are all the terms used in the document. This seemingly contradictory strategy, the idea that something can be both different and similar, it's like jumbo shrimp, you know, this kind of an interesting uh, 
slightly contradictory idea there, although I don't believe it is ultimately contradictory, but it seems that way on the surface. Uh, the new work uh, would be differentiated through the use of contrasting materials and forms and made compatible by maintaining similar massing and horizontal alignments. For example, the new building might be made the same height. And that's what we see here in Harry Weiss's addition to the Newberry Library, which has very little in common with uh, uh, the original uh, Rena uh, Romanesque revival building, except that they're about the same height. This uh, project uh, from 1981 was for many years shown in the guidelines published by the National Park Service as an example of an addition that meets the secretary's standards. And you can see the quote there from uh, the official guidelines. As a consequence, hundreds of additions exhibiting alien materials, composition, and scale have been constructed that are clearly differentiated, while the requirement that they also be compatible has been rendered uh, considerably harder to discern. Across the nation, many local design review boards and historic district commissions continue to enforce uncritically a strategy of willful contrast in the interest of making the construction date of each part of a site identifiable at a glance. While the National Park Service itself has tried to counteract this false interpretation of the standards in more recent publications, for example, the 2010 revision and new edition of their Preservation Briefs 14 on exterior additions to historic structures, a broader view has not trickled down very far into the state and local levels. This is why I don't believe the problem is the language of the standards. The problem has always been the interpretation of those terms and the illustrations that were given. Now, the newer illustrations, it's interesting, if you've seen Preservation Briefs 14, includes both modernist and traditional editions that meet the standards. So that's kind of an interesting step to kind of make a more diverse reading. Dramatizing the difference between the past and the present can easily take priority over visual continuity or sense of place. Indeed, designs that seek wholeness and continuity between the new and the old are sometimes seen as suspect and labeled false history. How many of you have heard that phrase, false history? That's, a, that's one that you hear quite frequently. It's a telling phrase because it reveals the assumption that the official narrative of the timeline is true while any attempt at diminishing the difference between different historical moments or suggesting that a historical moment from 50 years ago might actually reappear or 500 years ago uh, is seen as false. Aside from the fact that this true-false dichotomy makes no sense in historiographic terms, an overemphasis on differentiating the old and the new is ultimately destructive of our cultural heritage. It introduces alien forms and materials into a site created with a completely different set of premises, um, uh, mandating an, uh, what essentially amounts to an adversarial relationship between buildings that precludes the creation of harmonious ensembles. This is plainly contrary to the aims of preservation itself. Now, just to avoid any misunderstanding, please don't think that I'm actually opposed to modernist architecture on principle. I'm not. I'm a great admirer of many of the buildings that we've seen here today. I worked for five years at Johnson Burgee in New York and went every day to work in the Seagram building and came to admire it very much. What I'm arguing against here is a kind of uncritical or knee-jerk idea that historical architecture and contemporary architecture must be in contrast and that the way to add to a historic building is to make a contrasting addition. That's, uh, for example, as John Vinci showed us just moments ago, if you're restoring a modernist building, uh, you don't expect to be told by the National Park Service that you must put a Georgian Revival red brick wing on a Mies building. Uh, so why should you do the opposite? For the same reasoning, many architects and preservationists oppose newly built structures in traditional styles or formal languages. A building in a style associated with an earlier date would be false history or create, as the National Park Service puts it, a false sense of historical development, which is a common misapplication of the Secretary's standards, not just to the individual site, 
but to the history of architecture in general. That wasn't the intent. After the ascendancy of the modern movement, buildings in an earlier style were considered false, fake, inauthentic, kitsch, pastiche, or Disneyland. Take your pick. Such inauthentic buildings impede our reading of buildings as documents of their time, undermining the narrative itself. What if you don't know when a building was built simply by looking at it? What then? Well, we would be in mass confusion, wouldn't we? Now, in New York, where I've spent most of my professional career, the approval by the Landmarks Preservation Commission of the project on the left required more than the usual amount of scrutiny, requiring several meetings over uh, 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 though a modernist scheme for the same site, same owner, same program, same budget, same massing, presented to the commission the previous year, sailed through with only two hearings. So what that shows us is that the commission was very skeptical that you could build a new classical building as a neighbor, here we go, new neighbor to a uh, Horace Trumbauer building next to it. And the Ralph Lauren store at 72nd and Madison Avenue uh, was in fact opposed by several mainstream preservation groups when it was first proposed because they felt that its traditional design diminished the real historical buildings around it. Real historical buildings that were only in some cases 60 or 70 years older. In fact, it is a very well designed and detailed building and not a copy of any other previous structure. Whatever you think of Ralph Lauren as an enterprise or this building, the building itself is an appropriate addition to its historic district, which is mostly in buildings of the same style. This building may or may not be to your taste, but I think it's hard to argue that it should not have been built for reasons having to do with historic preservation. The enforced sequestration of new and old has had other consequences for our heritage environment that are far more serious than quarrels over style. In recent decades, we've seen the museumification of historic centers, gentrification of economically diverse neighborhoods, and the pressures of mass tourism. Chicagoans will be all too familiar with these problems. Some critics are now starting to blame historic preservation for what uh, we might call the problems of success uh, afflicting many of our most desirable neighborhoods and cities. But a moment's thought shows that these are consequences of increasing demand for places characterized by mixed use, walkability, human scale, a strong sense of place, and visual beauty, and a limited supply of such places. Contemporary development, according to the conventional time-based urbanism, has for half a century or more sought to replace the traditional city with an anti-urban landscape of skyscrapers or suburban sprawl. In my view, the focus on expressing our time in architectural terms has all but destroyed our ability to make new places that are culturally and environmentally sustainable, putting great pressure on existing places that already are. Naturally, those among us who can afford to live wherever we wish will soon drive out those who must live wherever they can, surrendering their historic neighborhoods to the more affluent. And Venetians will have to put up with cruise ships that are six times larger than any building in the city of Venice. This is not really a preservation issue, but a matter of social and economic justice. But we architects cannot duck responsibility for creating cities in which historic centers become affluent enclaves surrounded by anti-urban suburbs increasingly occupied by the poor, a condition precisely the inverse of the way it was about 40 years ago. Another consequence of current attitudes is the continuing destruction of historic places that have survived intact until now. Cities admired all over the world for their beauty are being, as the term goes, reinvented for the sake of keeping up with the time. The Grand Canal in Venice has now, in my opinion, been diminished by the construction of a banal addition to the Santa Chiara Hotel, presumably to keep up to date with Santiago Calatrava's bridge immediately next door. In Paris, a new wavy glass facade for the Samaritan department store on the Rue de Rivoli 
will soon deface one of the world's great streets, despite widespread public opposition. Herzog and de Meuron's Tour Triangle, along with a series of other proposed skyscrapers, threatens the center of what is nearly universally acclaimed to be the world's most beautiful city. The mayor, Anne Hidalgo, justifies these moves by claiming that Paris must be reinvented in order not to become a museum. But anyone who has seen Paris knows that this vital center is anything but a museum. Paradoxically, the socialist mayor seems bent on turning Paris into a colossal exhibition of corporate logos. There is indeed an unavoidable political dimension to this whole issue. When we talk about the architecture of our time, whose time are we talking about? Who determines what our time is or what the future should look like? Who is the we presupposed by that hour? A century ago, the zeitgeist was defined by philosophies and political movements that proposed social change based on various forms of idealism, as Bob Adam pointed out earlier today. Oh, that's hard to compete with that. Okay. The early success of the modern movement was in part due to its alliance with a progressive reform movement in response to industrialization, technology, and the disaster of the First World War, as also Mark was talking about. Traditional architecture was seen, wrongly I would argue, as representing the old order to be overthrown. But since the 1989 fall of the Berlin Wall and the apparent triumph of global capitalism, the idealist, um, uh, pardon me, the, uh, of global capitalism, the idealist reformist narrative has been steadily replaced by what we might describe as the cynical marketing strategies of global corporations and the architects who serve them. In the end, the architecture of our time, and with it, the future, start looking more and more like what serves the marketing campaigns of these firms. Renzo Piano, when asked what he thought of those who opposed his skyscraper in Torino, replied, they are afraid of the future. They are afraid of the future, and that's why they don't like my building. In his mind, at least, his ideas and the future are the same thing. Now, that's a great marketing strategy for your firm, if you can make that claim. From its coming into prominence in the 1960s, historic preservation defined itself as a countervailing force against what it saw as the juggernaut of overdevelopment and the loss of place. Grassroots preservationists literally threw themselves in front of wrecking balls and bulldozers, some actually giving their lives, to defend places they valued. But the professionals leading the movement were not necessarily opposed to the cultural and architectural assumptions that spurred the very projects that they were seeking to block. Modern preservation philosophy was itself a document of its time a time when dramatizing the difference between historic and contemporary architecture was the paramount concern. Now, the most important development in architecture in the last 30 years has been the recovery of place as the principal concern of the architect, and along with it, the reappearance of traditional architecture in contemporary practice. But if you attend the exhibits of the architecture biennial, you would hardly get that impression because the architectural establishment still largely refuses to recognize this, clinging to its concept of what our time is all about. The official definition of the architecture of our time admits Frank Gehry, but not Quinlan Terry, and we could name corresponding Chicago figures, some of whom have appeared on today's program. Dissenting views have always been present, even though often suppressed, and the preservation movement is now split between the historical determinism of our time and a much older conception, which after long struggle is once again gaining ground. The architecture of our time is being challenged by the architecture of our place. As a first step, as a first step, we can get rid of the official narrative and its simplistic timeline. The history of architecture is a complex interaction of different styles, each of which extends across time and space according to its own internal logic. 
A style may dominate a period only to disappear and then reappear later, maybe centuries later. Sometimes seemingly contradictory styles operate at the same moment or even in the same building. Designs made at one moment might intentionally recall those of another. This is how traditional architecture works, as Robert Stern has said, always looking backward to move forward. Classical architecture, for example, is characterized not by distinct periods, but by an alternation of what Andres Duany has termed calls to order and drift. History, in this view, is not a timeline, but a pendulum whose broad arcs sweep across time as we sometimes reassert first principles and sometimes go off on tangents, exploring new possibilities or dead ends, as the case may be, only to be drawn back again to the fundamentals of our discipline. In this way, the character of a place may develop over time, but time does not determine that character. A building in a style associated with an earlier date is legitimate if it reinforces the character already present in the place, lending continuity and wholeness to the ensemble of buildings in which it rises. Every new building in a historic setting joins a conversation already in progress. It's kind of like showing up late to a dinner party or a cocktail reception, and you walk into the room and you realize you don't know anyone there. But there are you know, four or five people sort of standing in a group near the door, so you kind of sidle up to them very discreetly, and you sort of listen for a while to see what they're talking about, nodding your head every once in a while, and then maybe gradually you join the conversation. You probably don't walk in the room and just start screaming. You know, I'm here. <laughs> it's about tact and decorum. Um, let's see, where are we here? The encounter calls for listening and the openness to the possibility we might learn something. When architects prioritize place over time, new buildings take their places in the streetscape, fitting in and making their own new contribution. How can a neighborhood change and grow without losing the qualities that made it desirable and worthy of conservation in the first place? A good guideline is that a new building in a historic setting seeks not necessarily to imitate what is already there, nor to transform its character into something entirely new, but to make the place more itself, as Andres Duany has expressed it. And I think that uh, at this point, I can say uh, I especially enjoyed Tom Beebe's presentation on the Washington Library because I think that's uh, essentially the spirit that he tried to uh, express to us today. Now, to make a place more itself, we must look beyond the historic site as a document of its time. Simply on a practical level, it is often hard to define the time that we're talking about. What time does the building document? Many of our most familiar monuments were realized over long periods with multiple construction phases extending across centuries. Consider the Cour Carré at the Louvre, where the right half of the facade was completed a century after the left side, which it precisely matches. Or the Piazza del Campidoglio in Rome, whose original design by Michelangelo was finally realized only in the 20th century, more than 400 years after it was originally designed. Similarly, our Capitol building in Washington represents nearly 200 years of alterations and expansions, all mostly in the same style. People who are not from Chicago may not know, although John Vinci was telling us about this, the story of the Carson Peary and Scott building, attributed to Lewis Sullivan and usually discussed as a single work, but was actually constructed in four phases over the course of more than 70 years, the work of three different firms, without substantially changing the design established in the first phase. Such buildings document not the time of their construction, but a persistent vision of the place. It is as if the idea of the place were so strong that it had to be realized, even if completion would come in a completely different time or in a way that seemed to contradict the time in which it was ultimately completed. Nothing could have been less of its time in 1865 than the completion of the US Capitol Dome as the nation was sliding into civil war, the dome itself capped by the figure of liberty. 
Now, this isn't just true of individual monuments. If we think about it, every new building in a pre-existing context is an intermediate phase of a longer project that will continue into the future. That longer project is the slow construction of the city as a whole, in which buildings jointly constitute places by consciously taking a sympathetic relation one to another, contributing to a collective form which persists through time and in spite of changes in taste over time. The early skyscrapers surrounding the Michigan Avenue Bridge, uh, which we also heard about before, and those forming the western wall of Grant Park show how buildings built at different times and in different styles can nonetheless acknowledge one another and together build a whole greater than the sum of the parts. For, and uh, it was pointed out the building we're in has a very curious relationship with the one across the street forming this kind of gateway that was pointed out earlier. Oh, we have a musical soundtrack. <laughs> and consider for a moment the political dimension. Now, I remarked that the idea of our time could be thought of as being politically contested among social and cultural elites. But our place is simply the public realm, our heritage as citizens. Places are founded and maintained by communities, often inhabited and supported by different communities at different times, and yet the identity of the place may persist for long periods. Places that inspire preservation do so because of the artistic, historical, or communal significance that contribute to our sense of enduring identity. As Vince Michael and others have noted, preservation as a movement needs to recognize this broader and more diverse view of significance, looking beyond artifacts and documents and times to see building cultures and communities. But you may ask, what becomes of authenticity in this new, brave new world that you're describing? If we abandon the time-specific evaluation of buildings, how will we know if they're real or fake? The simple answer is this. Once we get rid of the timeline, discerning the authentic and the fake are no longer a matter of matching construction time to style or period, but a matter of a site's participation in a building culture. The NARA Charter of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, or ICOMOS, defines authenticity as, quote, the trustworthiness of the evidence for its significance presented by the site, unquote. An authentic historic site, then, is one that tells the truth about how it came to be and how it could continue into the future. An inauthentic site introduces forms and materials that obscure valued character. The date of construction is of little relevance in either case. An out outstanding example of a non-time-based authenticity is the Issei Shrine in Japan, which has been rebuilt ritually every 20 years for the last 500 or so. Its authenticity is obviously not a function of the age of the material, which is never more than 20 years old, but the culture that preserves the knowledge and skills to reproduce it anew in every generation. The 20-year interval registers both the effective life of the perishable materials used, the wood, paper, and so forth, but also the time it takes to train a new cohort of craftsmen to do the next temple. This is an example of intangible heritage. The know-how to rebuild the temple is the resource, more than the physical temple in any of its individual incarnations. It is also an example of the cultivation of mastery as the key to the persistence of the character of a place through time. Style, in this example, is not a historical period, but a form of mastery, illustrating how we build here, and potentially remaining valid across long spans of time. One of my famous, uh, favorite Capsulations of the idea comes from Françoise Chouet in her book, The History of uh, the uh, Historical Monument. She says, we restore in order to learn how to build. I think that's what this is illustrating. The same is true of Western buildings in what might have been thought more permanent materials. In truth, no material is actually permanent, making replacement and, uh, and unavoidable and leading us to a kind of slow motion reconstruction. <clears throat> 
How many of the stones visible today in Westminster Abbey were placed there in the 13th or 14th century? I can't give you the exact number, but I think we would all be surprised how few they are. More importantly, it's not just the age of the stones that maintains the structure's authenticity, but the capacity to carve new ones when the old can no longer serve. That is also significant. That capacity to make the new stones should be the real object of preservation, not just the stones themselves, though naturally we should preserve the stones as long as they can serve. Such an ongoing culture of building is the basis of style and the key to the persistence of character in a place. It is the intangible heritage that makes possible the survivor over the long term of the tangible heritage that we want to preserve. So what guideline can we look to in order to restore old buildings properly and make new ones that will contribute to vital cities full of character? I suggest that being attentive to place means adding only what is appropriate to the place. Now that word appropriate is a key but loaded term in preservation that no one seems able to define. I've been, I guess, maybe somewhat reckless in proposing a definition, and my definition is that the appropriate is the fitting and the exemplary. Appropriateness is having respect for what is already there and taking responsibility for what comes next. First, add only what fits in the place and not what does not belong there. This is not a highly specialized aesthetic judgment, but a simple recognition of what goes with what. Pretty much anyone can figure that one out. Second, set a good example by adding only what you would want to see more of, knowing that any project thought to be successful will be imitated. We should only build what, if there were to be more such buildings, would make a good city. It's kind of an architectural version of the golden rule. We cannot leave the future of our cities to the vagaries of the time. God knows where the zeitgeist is headed. We have to take responsibility in the present for what is likely to come next. The standard of appropriateness is our best chance to create a future that will itself be worthy of preservation a century from now. <clears throat> I'm going to show you a couple of things from our program at Notre Dame, which you may or may not be familiar with. If we love a historic environment and want to preserve it, we have to first understand it so that we can intervene in ways that enhance rather than diminish it. The sad truth is that many preservation architects have not studied the design in the styles of the sites under their care. Perhaps this is the reason why mid-century modern has become so uh, fashionable in preservation circles. The architects say, finally, a style I actually understand. If we are to prioritize place over time, we need to understand all of our heritage, all of its styles, not just the ones that are, in fact, within living memory. And so we have to understand them within their respective building cultures, not simply as documents of times long past and no longer truly understood. In our program at Notre Dame, as many of you know, traditional architecture and urbanism have been the center of our curriculum for about a quarter century now. And many of our alumni have enjoyed success designing and building new traditional buildings and neighborhoods. Perhaps some of them are here today and perhaps some of them are in your office. I'd like to share with you some recent projects by our students set here in Chicago that illustrate our approach. Here is a uh, proposal by uh, some of our fifth year students who conducted their, uh, a studio here during the summer with Professor David Mayernick and did um, additions to the Newberry Library to create a performance theater for the Newberry Consort, which is one of the leading ensembles for Baroque music and opera today. And so in this case, a student has not, you'll notice, replicated the original building, but has added to it in a way that tries to take the language and extend it around the corner, creating a new structure for a new use. Here, one of my students a couple of years ago, uh, incidentally, a student from China, and I think that's relevant only because I had assumed that students from China might have more difficulty understanding Western classicism than Western students would. In fact, it's the opposite. I found that the Chinese students get Western classicism immediately, 
and it's our students who are from suburban Chicago who have the most trouble understanding the classical language. This student, on his own, decided that McKim, Mead, and White were the thing and really made a very interesting study and created a new building for a fictitious academy of the decorative arts here in Chicago, uh, very much based on his studies of McKim, Mead, and White, uh, and really got down into the details. Um, here is a, a, a proposal uh, I won't call it a counter project, but let's just say it's for the same program and site as the new annex building at Fourth Presbyterian Church. I, I need to thank our friends at Gensler because they were extremely gracious and generous. They shared all of their drawings and their program and their story of the project with us, and we really enjoyed that, having a tour of the office. After the projects were done, we went back and showed them what the students had done, and our friends at Gensler were very surprised because they had told us when we first met with them, yes, we thought we might be able to make a, a, a Gothic edition, but we realized that that's kind of impossible today. So then we decided not to pursue that. So they were very surprised to see five student projects that were Gothic uh, presented to them, and some of them very convincing. I hope you'll agree. Um, and a, an infill building next in the sort of semi-vacant site next to the Murphy Memorial, uh, for another uh, decorative arts academy. It's a project I like to give because it gives the student the opportunity to basically make a loft building and then decorate the outside of it in ways that use terracotta and so forth. And in this case, the student has seen both the urban aspects of the building and the decorative details as, as a unity. I'm actually also very happy to announce, as, as Kim mentioned, we have just inaugurated this year a Master of Science in Historic Preservation. And one of the things that we're happy about is that our students get to spend a semester in Rome where they get hands-on uh, uh, experience. It not, it, there aren't many students who actually get to touch the Temple of Saturn and measure it with uh, 3D scanners and all of these kinds of high-tech equipment, but uh, that's what they've been doing. Or getting a tour of the Parthenon restoration from the architects who are doing the work and get to actually touch both the new pentelican marble and the ancient pentelican marble, which are being fused together in order to essentially undo the previous restoration and, and, and sort of move the Parthenon forward. So this same training in traditional design, we believe, is essential also for the practice of historic preservation if practitioners are to preserve as well as contribute to historic settings without distracting from them or ruining them potentially. For that reason, uh, I hope you'll learn more about our program. I did leave some brochures on the table, but when I came in just now, I saw most of them were taken, so thank you. I hope you are taking them home with you. Um, so we hope that this will result in a new generation of preservation architects who will make uh, continuity and, tr and uh, wholeness in the built environment a priority. In the end, in my conclusion, I believe that if we take care of place, Time will take care of itself. We don't have to worry about being of our time because, frankly, whatever we do will be of our time. Because we decide what our time is about in the act of making it. It's not there ahead of us. We don't have a memo telling us what it will be. We have to make it. Including preserving those aspects of the historic environment that we value enough to want to carry with us into the future. Preservation is also of our time because we're doing it. It's, it's a very timely activity. The real imperative of our time, it seems to me, is the stewardship of place, the places we find significant, whatever their dates of construction and whatever their style, whether it's Crown Hall or whether it's the Parthenon. This is a small but necessary piece of a much larger challenge we face today of reforming our built environment to bring it into greater harmony with the natural world and with basic human needs. I might also add, parenthetically, our stewardship of humane and dignified places forms an essential part of what might be our response to Pope Francis's call for the care of our common home by making and conserving places that are beautiful, sustainable, and just. Thank you all very much.